Just joining us, welcome to today's webinar on engaging students in the virtual classroom hosted by class for zoom. My name is Meg McCall and I lead our content and product marketing at class for zoom. I will be moderating today's conversation with our panelists who I'll introduce you all to in just a moment. Um, today we'll be talking about the challenge of virtual student engagement and five tips for increasing student engagement on web conferencing platforms like Zoom. A couple of quick housekeeping items. If you have questions for our panelists, please ask them in the Q&A feature throughout the session so that we can answer those at the end. Um, a webinar recording along with the slides will be provided to all attendees after the webinar today. And for those of you who are watching this at a later time, you can email your questions to hello at classforzoom.com and we'll get back to you there. So in just a minute, I'll introduce our panelists. We'll talk a bit about class for Zoom, but we'll spend the majority of our time talking through the challenges around student engagement and share some tips for engaging learners in the virtual classroom. We'll then leave time at the end for audience questions that come up throughout the session. On our panel today, I am pleased to introduce Randy Tyndall, who is the Senior Instructional Technologist at the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. Randy, you can give a wave. And Spencer Lawson, our Vice President of Services at Class for Zoom, who is joining us from Williamsburg, Virginia. We were planning to feature a third panelist today, Ty Campbell, who you may have seen on our website and in our emails. Unfortunately, he had a last minute schedule change, so he's unable to join today. Um, I myself am a former educator, so I know that school obligations can come out of nowhere, um, as many of you on this call probably know. But I do know we'll have a great conversation today with Randy and Spencer, and we thank you for your patience with this change. Uh, now, before we get started, Randy, I'm wondering if you can give us a quick overview of how your role and responsibilities have evolved since March of 2020. Oh, they've gotten more. Thank you, by the way. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so my role has changed dramatically because before March 20th, if I remember correctly, uh, it was every day, uh, just the everyday routine. However, what I am is a um, administrator for Zoom, Zoom webinars, um, Echo 360, another lecture capture platform, media site. Plus, I train faculty and provide the uh, classroom support for them. Um, but I'm a part of a team of nine other people. Um, so before March 20th, it was like, you know, controlled chaos. But just when March 20th, just before March 20th came, it became very apparent that we had to change course dramatically. Um, so we quickly brought everybody online as much as possible and talked them through a lot of things and held multiple online sessions talking folks through everything. So yes, it has changed dramatically. My uh, drinking habits ha have gotten worse, but I, uh, I can recover. At, at least I admit that. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and Spencer, can you tell us a bit about web conferencing in education and how class for Zoom fits in? Sure. No, I, I, absolutely. You know, uh, first off, I want to say thank you, Classy, to you and Meg for the webinar. Thank you so much, Randy, for participating. I uh, really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, that we're going to be having today. It's a very important one. Uh, you know, I've, I have 20 years of educational technology experience. And in the last year, you know, the conversations have changed pretty dramatically, especially in the K-12 arena. You know, when we've had conversations, we've tried to be very strategic. And in the last year, the conversations changed to, you know, educational technology being a nice to have to being something that's absolutely a requirement. Educational technology is something that has to be present to help respond to, to the requirements of, of having online classes and being able to be flexible 
uh, and in delivering different types of modalities of education, whether it be hybrid or fully online, uh, just being able to be flexible and responding to unique challenges. And, and sometimes those are social, political, sometimes those are, are pandemics. Uh, we, just, we just recognize that uh, business as usual just isn't, isn't, um, isn't acceptable anymore. We have to be able to be very flexible and dynamic in the way that we respond to it. But there's a cost to that. And it's not 100%, like, in, especially in K-12, switching online isn't 100% analogous for these K-12 students. Like, there's an emotional cost and there's something that's lost. And we're struggling as educators to recuperate that. Um, and that's why the topic of this, of this webinar is so important. And we've learned a lot in the last year as educators uh, in, in responding to that. And so, you know, moving on to the next slide here, um, you know, we learned these, these stats here of, um, uh, you know, we've learned 87% um, of educators said that their ability to use educational technology has improved uh since since you know school started closing last spring but 71 percent of instructors still say that increasing the amount of student engagement is a top priority for them um and um and then we also see that the biggest threat that we have is that low quality uh remote instruction uh could lead to tremendous loss almost seven to 10, seven to 11 months of lost learning. And that's represented because if you, if you know, do Google search on the headlines, we're seeing that you know, uh, students failing at record rates in, in K-12. And it's a real challenge because in, in a lot of that is, is students are struggling in this online world. And a large part of that is, the, is responding to online instruction, feeling disconnected from their teachers, feeling disconnected to the support services that many institutions, many school districts are providing to them, but they don't know how to effectively engage to them. Or parents who are usually highly involved with their students' education don't know how to effectively engage with those services now that everything's being off offered remote. And it's a real challenge to them. So finding new, unique, innovative ways to increase engagement in a virtual classroom setting is, is, is a new paramount challenge that everyone's trying to solve. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So I'm really excited. Uh, and we're here uh, in part with, uh, with, uh, with a new product and a new company called Class for Zoom. We're really excited to talk about Class for Zoom. Uh, and uh, next slide here, uh, we'll introduce the product here just briefly. Uh, but basically what we've taken is this world-class platform that we're all pretty familiar with, which is Zoom. And we kind of layer into Zoom the, a concrete set of teaching and learning and measurement tools that are built on top of Zoom, designed to enhance what we're talking about here, uh, really concrete engagement functionality uh, and attendance and ID verification, proctoring for exams, seating charts, classroom management tools that really empower teachers and institutions with all the tools that they need to really kind of deliver on the topics that we're gonna to be talking about today. And so what the goal is, is that we can start diving into this really tough topic of in the classroom, enhancing student and teacher engagement, and then provide tools and platforms to, to take that to the next level. Excellent. So we know increasing student engagement is a top priority for most instructors, uh, we're going to talk through ways to engage learners in the virtual classroom today. But first, let's hear why student engagement is so challenging to accomplish through web conferencing. Challenges educators are facing when it comes to learning engagement online are unprecedented. As you all know, tried and true techniques like one-on-one -on -one discussion, group presentations, and assessments are much more challenging to facilitate in the virtual classroom. Um, Randy, I'd love to hear from you. What have you heard from most instructors that they're having trouble accomplishing through distance learning? Well, yeah, thank you. The uh, first thing really is sort of a basic thing is they have, many students have trouble logging in. Um, and then once they've logged in, it's 
it's hard for an instructor to maintain focus um, because that it's easy to be distracted these days with everything going on, including, oh, I'll be on the class, but I'm going to look at my phone at the same time. So it's uh, it's kind of a trying to maintain focus and everything like that. That has been really the big thing between that and the uh, Zoom bombing, you know. Yeah, that's, oh, sorry, Meg. Yeah, just to keep going, you know, all eyes are on everyone. You know, one of the problems that we see in, in, in K-12 quite a bit is, you know, a lot of districts have rules like, you know, you can't force your students to have their camera on and, you know, students need to opt into having their camera on and having that camera on really helps with the engagement. It helps everyone feel part of the class, but when students don't want to have their camera on and they have to opt into it, you know, you have issues like cyberbullying where students feel like, well, if I have my camera on, they're going to screenshot my camera. And next thing you know, they're posting on social media and making fun of me and whatnot. Like students don't feel like their identity or their, their, their camera feed isn't being protected. And so a lot of times like they, students are hesitant to turn their camera on or fully engage in the classroom because they don't feel like that they, if they do that, they're leaving themselves vulnerable in, in unhealthy ways to the other kids in the class. It's true. Um, yeah, there are a lot of other other issues that students have. I mean, for some students, it's a matter of finding a quiet place to join in. For other students, it could be a matter of trying to find an internet connection to join in. So um, it's it's tough. It's tough. Right. Yeah, and I think the net effect uh, of those issues, you know, there's siblings like, uh, you know, we talk about like the work meetings and like, you know, trying to find a quiet place for us to join in for work. Well, I think older students, especially high school students feel exactly the same way. They're worried about younger siblings bursting in the room and then making noise and then making, you know, other kids making fun of them because they have younger siblings making ruckus and whatnot. And so they tend to isolate themselves from the rest of the class they don't want to engage but the net effect is is that they are engaging less and less in their classes and either them not connecting the way they should or the teacher not engaging with them like they should but the net effect is is what you're what you're seeing in this graph is that they're not feeling connected in with their school community with their school adults or with their classmates and so if you stack those two bars there, uh, the 22% for school community, 50%, those two blue bars, that's an overwhelming majority of the students are not are either not feeling connected at all or feeling only somewhat connected, mm -hmm. which is a really troubling number. Um, Randy, I don't know if you have any insight into those numbers or if you're seeing those uh, at your institution, but those are those are kind of scary numbers. Yeah, we've, we've done a survey of our students and it's a really a mixed bag because since they're higher ed students, some of them know what they're in for, others um, are having trouble with that. And I think the faculty are very aware of that and are trying their hardest to use different techniques to try to engage the students to bring them back in, so to speak, uh, into the conversation, whether it's uh, through a breakout room, whether it's through just uh, on-screen uh, polls or any sort of interactive uh, device, something to bring them, bring them away from whatever else they're doing and bring the focus again, the focus back into what's going on. Absolutely. Spencer and Randy, what you what I heard from both of you is that feeling connected goes hand in hand with virtual classroom engagement, which of course is is critical and is why we're we're here today. Um, and this lack of connection typically indicates a weakened sense of community, um, which is particularly critical because learning outcomes are at risk on the next slide. Um, you'll see learning outcomes are at risk when engagement is low. And not only that, um, there are stats that help to support that students from marginalized populations are disproportionately impacted. Um, Spencer, I know we'll have some, some stats that will show up here in just a minute. If you could walk us through that, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. 
And, you know, I'm scanning through the comments here in the comment section. I think there's some excellent points being made here that, you know, it's also like an equity or, or equality issue as well, because there's some people who don't have access to technology uh, on, on equal footing. You know, some districts have one-to-one -one programs where everyone gets the exact same machine, but some people don't have access to the same type of machines as others. So they don't have the ability to have machines that can run virtual backgrounds. And so, for example, if you have a messy house, you don't want to put that webcam on because you, you, you have a messy house and you don't want your classmates to see that messy house. Or if you have a noisy environment, you don't want to unmute your phone because you don't want people to hear that, that noisy background. Um, and so if you're in, in different environments and so, and so it becomes a very difficult situation to navigate, um, when you, when you start talking about these types of these issues that, that cause this isolation connectedness, um, on the next slide here, uh, if we can advance over, we start talking about why it matters and, and different groups, as I was talking about an equity issue, but we know that these issues tend to affect different student populations differently. Um, and if we start looking at uh, even um, uh, racial demographics, we know that they tend to affect um, uh, Black and Hispanic populations significantly higher. And so what happens here is that we need to really make efforts to, to engage these populations uh, as best we can and we know that efforts to overcome these hurdles, as difficult as they may be, do pay off. If we go ahead and jump to the next slide, we have, uh, we have some stats that says here that the percent of youth offered social or emotional support by an adult from their school, 60% uh, of them said that they were offered and 93% of those that were offered that support from the adult found it useful. And so one, I mean, a little bit more than half of the half of the students were offered emotional support from adults, but of the ones that were offered that 93% of it found it at least a little helpful. So what that says to me is, is where whatever support an adult can offer to, to a student or someone in, in these environments, that, that that help will probably be very much needed and appreciated. And so whatever effort we can make, we should make. Now, I think a lot of the, this data right here is from the, uh, the uh, K-12 arena, but uh, Randy, are you seeing numbers like this? Or are you aware of studies uh, uh, from, from the higher ed or from your institution? Um, you know, I know there is always an issue and it is, I don't have facts and, and uh, numbers on that, but I know just from typically students have, have problems with that. And then it's really exacerbated with, uh, by going to a virtual platform. So it's even more acute um, for these students. So I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that it's that, that high. Knowing how important engagement is to student learning and retention, um, we have worked with educators to compile five tips for student engagement in distance learning um, that Spencer and Randy will walk through this afternoon. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. Tip number one is to get buy-in. One of the best ways to increase student buy-in is giving students a say in what and how they learn. Um, so Spencer, what are some ways that this could play out for, for educators in the classroom? Sure, yeah, there, there seems to always be this like uh, values and tension, right? Where you have control or course structure and and you have uh, engagement right with students like you the more you loosen up on the control the more engaged they'll be and so if you try and give you know give them more of like you set these broad boundaries or the, like these bumpers on the bowling alley where you put the bumpers and you basically say you know, I'm going to loosen up on the control and I'm going to empower the students to have a little bit more control over the direction of where they're going to go within these rough boundaries, the more engaged they're going to be, where you can kind of set up 
through tools like in-class response systems or through polling or through, uh, through kind of, um, you know, even the Socratic method in a lecture, set up a, a choose your own adventure style of a lecture, you can get them highly engaged in what's going on because you feel, because they, you kind of, you kind of offer up some of the control of the direction of, of, of where you kind of go, but then you give that to the student and then the students kind of feel like they're kind of do, steering the ship a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so you get buy-in, you get them kind of steering the ship a little bit and all of a sudden they feel like they're in control and they're kind of directing the ship and, and, it, and it comes a way in which they become highly engaged uh, in the process. And it's hard to do when you're in the, in the online environment, when you're in, a, in, a, in an online meeting and you're in tools like Zoom or, or WebEx or in Google Meet, because uh, it's, it's much harder to, to be that dynamic. And so implementing like an online, real-time online poll, uh, like you can in class for Zoom, makes that really easy. It makes it a snap because it, it, um, you can just launch the poll and you, if you do a little bit of planning, if you plan for that type of uh, dynamic action, it makes it really easy. It's true, it's true, Spencer. Uh, Spencer um, I, we have found at the beginning of March, once we switched over to all virtual classes, some faculty adapted to it fairly well. Other faculty, because it was the sort of the middle of the semester, they, um, still wanted to teach the same old way, which is, you know, stand up in front of the camera or the stage and present static slides and expect the students to respond like they would normally. That doesn't, that doesn't cut it anymore. That really doesn't. So you really have to try to engage the student and I won't say spice up everything, but make it more attractive. I'm not sure you would like to sit through an hour's uh, lecture that just had slide after slide after slide with or without the instructor's uh, camera on. Uh, okay. Unless they're an amazingly uh, well-versed vocally and have some amazing pictures or something that you've never seen before, you're gonna lose the students. So you really have to do something to engage the students. Um, and there are just a lot of little tools that you can do it with. Yeah, and, and it's not a one or done thing. It's not like, well, I did my poll at the beginning of class and then I'm gonna go on for an hour in that direction. It's like every 15 minutes, stop. Like do a check on learning, do a, do a like, hey, are you still with me? Or let's spice it up. Or just like what you said, every 15, 20 minutes, be, be soliciting something from the students to keep them engaged, to keep them interacting, or they're just going to tune out. Well, yeah. it, and it also helps you as the instructor, because you may be going down a path and your students with or without their cameras on may uh, start getting confused. And without that feedback coming from you, because when you were doing face-to-face, -face, you, could, you could see confusion or, you know, students squirming in their desks. Now you really don't have that to react to. So you really knew, do need to uh, seek out, you know, feedback from them, say chat, or, you know, raise your hand if you're having problems understanding what I'm talking about. Let's, let's start doing a, a conversation back and forth. And feel, you know, uh, don't be so locked in to what you had planned to do. Because depending on the mood of the students that day, and it could be several students or something that occurred outside of class, they may want to talk about something that occurred. Yeah. Because this, for the most part, is the social community for, for your class, for your school. And students may want to talk about something that occurred. You can tie it, maybe tie it back into what you were, the uh, uh, instruction, the subject you were t talking about during that time, but you know, cut cut them some slack because they're they're still finding their way as you are too. So uh, you know, we will get through this. It's just different. Yeah. That's all. I appreciate no, Randy, that. You're hundred percent right. And you know, the the more and more we've been learning about education, how people learn, we're learning that education isn't this vertical experience where we have someone just lecturing at us. It's very much a horizontal collaborative experience. But you can't have that experience if you don't stop 
and include them into the conversation. And if you're not stopping including them into the collaboration, into the experience, you can't allow that horizontal action to take place. And so having frequent stops that are meaningful engagements, uh, that collaboration can't take place. That's a great segue, Spencer, into our second tip. Uh, our tip number two is to encourage collaboration, um, which again, we know is much more of a challenge when classes are held virtually. Uh, but there are tools available to support this uh, that I know many instructors are taking advantage of, like breakout rooms. Randy, how have you seen instructors uh, leverage that tool in their classrooms? Break, yeah. yeah, breakout rooms are somewhat of a challenge for, for some faculty. Some faculty want to dive into it, uh, you know, feet first. And others, you know, we have to, from my aspect, my uh, perspective, I have to, you know, explain to them what they can and can't do. Um, we have an instructor that I was dealing with earlier today, as a matter of fact, that has, let's see, I think she said she had 29 breakout rooms. And I know that, that, that my reaction was, okay. <laughs> so, but she also wanted to pre-assign the students to those breakout rooms. So uh, as a part of our, my areas, uh, task is to try to get faculty comfortable with collaborative uh, tools, and one of which is using breakout rooms. And we, so you know, we do training. Um, other things that people may want to use are things like uh, our institution also has Microsoft Teams, and we're not using that in conjunction right now. That doesn't mean that we can't. Um, I saw on our listserv, because we do have a listserv for the faculty to post ideas and questions, um, they start asking about using the program Slack and you know, just, just to use that as kind of a back and forth with the students in or outside of class. And that's, I think that's perfectly usable. You just have to set some limits, set some guidelines on that. One other thing for interactive, in, in terms of trying to encourage collaboration is I've started encouraging and have been using, uh, encouraging faculty to use explain everything, which if you have an iPad and want to involve your students, it can be an iPad or a, a PC or Mac, that has built-in collaborative tools where you can get your students who are working online and just hop in and start writing on the same thing that you're presenting from. So there are a lot of collaborative tools out there. So anything that's, I won't say a little different, but uh, is just a different tool that can you feel comfortable with as a faculty member. One of the things I like to do uh, with breakout rooms is kind of put the classroom on its head a little bit and start the class off like the first half of class have the rooms, breakout rooms pre-assigned and have the breakout rooms pre-broken pre up with resources in each of the breakout rooms and basically say you had the first half of class to learn about a particular topic and then the second half of class you're going to present on that topic as a breakout room or as a group to the rest of the class. And what's nice is, is as you rejoin the class, we're going to take each group and put you into the front of the class and you're going to present as a group to the rest of the class. And so that, that last bullet item there is establish accountability for your conversation. It's not just kind of a free for all in the breakout room. It's like a very guided experience of you're going to go through these resources, but then also you're going to, you, you know, at the end of the session, you're going to need to come back and you're going to need to present in kind of this um, guided conversation. You need to pick out the most salient points and then teach the rest of the class what you all discussed and what you all learned. It, it, it really kind of causes the class to focus, uh, you know, the conversation and pick out the most important parts. I love that from a content perspective, because we know that uh, students and adults alike will learn a subject better if they then have to teach it to their peers or their colleagues. So from a knowledge retention perspective, that's fantastic. But that also leads us into our third tip of fostering connection. Um, among the classes and among the students. So building community is something that typically happens organically in person 
through casual conversations in the hallway or when transitioning to classes. Um, but Randy, how are you seeing this play out for, for educators or, or how, what are some of the strategies? That well, are okay. So uh, instructors before, it was like stand in front of the class, here are my office hours. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll see you later. Uh, now, I think it's more imperative that the faculty, the instructor be available and publicize, here are my office hours, I'm available these times, all these days. I've told them, I said, here's how you can set it up via Zoom, just have a recurring meeting. You don't have to just make it work, make it go or start the meeting. And if no one's there, fine, just leave it open. And if someone comes in, great, you can talk to them. Otherwise, go ahead about your business in your office. Uh, but, you know, encourage that uh, as a faculty member. Um, also, when others or, uh, other students might be in breakout rooms, I would say, you know, if you have a question, send it to me in private chat. Yeah, if we need to talk about that, let's do that. Um, one other thing that initially I recommended, but I've since, I don't know, I, I'm, the jury's still out on that, is in Zoom, you have the ability to start a meeting early uh, where you can allow the students to come in early. And I equated that to, well, if you're in a regular uh, mortar classroom, brick and mortar classroom, students are in there and they're talking before class. Why not let them do that? Well, that's good, but it, for some folks who were recording the class automatically, it, it was like hard to, to get things started. So um, I still like the idea that the students need to be students for a little while before you come in uh, and whether or not you still don't start the, the class until after you come in and then give them a break at some point um, or give them a break at the front and then start things up because students still need to connect with other students. And they could be, there could be someone that they, they know that they haven't seen in you know, a couple of years. Um, so again, those sort of uh, icebreakers that you need to do to start making connections, you know, like the old, uh, what's the one thing that people don't know about you that you, you, know, you wanna share and uh, yeah. Starting early is fine. Staying late is great too. Uh, some people don't have that option, but uh, yeah. And uh, I encourage that as much as possible. So yeah, and, and the dovetail off of what Randy said, and I'm also reading some of the comments um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the chat. And I, you know, just thinking back about some of the inspiring stories that we've heard about teachers that made an impact in our lives. You know, there is an importance around small talk. There is importance around chit chat. And part of it is what we're really communicating is that we care, right? We care about our students. We care about those that we're educating. And if you really talk about making a difference in the lives of our students, we need an opportunity outside the context of the strict confines of our lesson plans that we care about those that we're educating. And that and it's in that space in which we can demonstrate that we care and that we create a room in which we can in which we can make a difference in the lives of those students. And that's so that's so critically important. Um, that can't be under that can't be overstated. And it's in those small moments of informality. Uh, and it's in those moments where connection can be made and opportunity to do something bigger. Uh, can happen, whether it's making a difference in someone's life or just communicating that you care is sometimes all that needs to happen. And so, and so planning for those moments of organic informal connection is critically, critically important. That's excellent. And any opportunity for students to get to know their classmates um, beyond just the grid and feel like they're part of a, a community um, is, is always critical. So well, one other thing, Meg, real quick is we have at UMass Lowell, we are give we give all of our students a Zoom account, a student Zoom account. So they can all meet all they want to by themselves. If they're doing a group project, they could meet by themselves in, in their groups do anything like that. So, 
anything that we can do to encourage and foster sort of communication and community, I, I'm all for it. That's fantastic. Excellent. Um, moving into our fourth tip, tip number four is to mix it up. Um, so one of the silver linings to come out of distance learning is that it has made inviting guest speakers into the classroom a whole lot easier since there is no travel time involved and, and few expenses typically. So um, Spencer, I know in a past life, if I can put you on the spot for a minute, sure. you, you've hosted virtual field trips in a past life of yours. What does that look like and how can educators uh, take advantage of something like this for their classes? Sure. So, so in my, in a past life, I used to work for a museum. I used to work for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Um, and uh, one of the things that we used to do was virtual field trips. And, and the, they took a, a couple of different uh, forms. Uh, but I know a lot of museums do these. And we did them before the pandemic and even after the pandemic. Uh, but a lot of uh, educational uh, institutions like museums do these virtual field trips where they can either be live or they can, they're can they pre-recorded and some of them are video, some of them have online games and tutorials and they do some type of combination of both. But the idea is, is that they want to expand their, their presence and they want people, for example, in Colonial Williamsburg, they wanted people to learn about 17th century and 18th century Virginia. And so they want to, they want to, everyone to learn about that. And so they have videos that, they, that, that can be shared with, with online games. And, uh, and uh, you can incorporate that into your learning management system. You can, you can do all types of things. And so consider exploring local museums that align with your curriculum and align with your lesson plans. And just maybe even give the museum a call and say, hey, do you offer virtual field trips? I even heard of one museum that had someone with a GoPro that would be willing to go around and do like a live tour of different exhibits. Um, and so get creative and, you know, mix it up. Uh, you know, there's no, you know, sky's the limit these days of what some museums would be willing to do in the name of a virtual field trip. It's true, it's true. Yeah, you have to mix it up. Like my virtual background, you know, from as the instructor, I, tend to like to change my background every time I meet with somebody so I could switch to something else real quick if need be. And, and I usually try to tie it into the weather. Uh, so yeah, we've got snow today, so I could do that. But if I were, if I were doing something else like, okay, it's test time, we're gonna be talking about something else and just to grab their attention, just to make them you know realize something different is going on. Uh, and people, tend to start wanting to tune in, to, you know, what, what are they going to do right now? Sorry about the baby shark. Um, but uh, you as the instructor need to not only mix up things from your perspective, but also for the students. Guest speakers are great. We always have had uh, faculty have taken advantage of guest speakers before the pandemic, and now it becomes crucial. And so we've had, let's see, uh, several, as a matter of fact, we do two or three webinars a week with uh, folks that come in virtually and talk to uh, students either as a part of a group or even from our perspective, it's also prospective students. So we have seminars for them all the time, uh, not only for our usual students, but also, like I said, the prospective students. But um, it's a lot easier now than it used to be because no one wants to travel. And if you can get to that person, you say, you know, can we spare a half hour, maybe 45 minutes of your time? And more than likely, they'll say, yes. We've had, my gosh, next week we have uh, Jonathan Lemire to talk about the politics. He's going to be coming on camera virtually coming on campus and uh, doing that for our Learning and Retirement Association. And it's also gonna be offered for the entire community. So there are things like that you can just use and try to reach out to folks. Um, some of these folks are as desperate as you are to meet other people at this point. And you know, anything that can be done to further uh, 
uh, the conversation or help them in their field is would be helpful for you too. So yeah, that is great to do. Excellent. I think that's fantastic. Um, our final tip today, tip number five, is just to make it fun. Um, the virtual backgrounds that Randy was just showcasing help a lot with that, but there are plenty of ways to inject excitement and energy into the classroom um, from educational video games to showing up for class in crazy costumes. Um, but Spencer, for those of us whose costume closets might be a little light, um, what are some other ways that we're hearing from educators that they're able to make class fun? Well, Randy kind of stole my thunder because my idea was I come up with fun virtual backgrounds. You uh, should change. Yeah, go ahead and change it, Spencer. Let's see. Yeah. I, I don't know how many I have in here. I use, my other account had a bunch of different virtual backgrounds that you can, you know, travel the world pretty, pretty quickly and easily with Zoom. And, you know, <laughs> if you're studying different things, you can be in colonial Virginia or you can be in, in San Francisco. You can bring the world in with your students uh, pretty quickly and you can travel the universe and, and uh, you can really bring the world to your students in new and interesting ways. Um, you know, we've read articles in the Washington Post, New York Times about the student, the teachers who show up in a new costume every single day. And that works for that teacher. We don't need to take it to that level, but there are a lot of fun and interesting things that you can do to keep your students engaged and, and have fun with things. And that's, you know, if it's fun for you and if you're having fun, that energy will transition to your learners. Um, and it's not just for K-12. Uh, my wife graduated neuroscience and she had a molecular biology teacher who dressed up once a week as a different molecule. And that's just what his, her college professor wanted to do. And, and that was a college, a tenured college professor, you know, and his passion, you know, went in and transferred over to, and that was her favorite college professor. Um, you know, you bring the energy and it's contagious. And I firmly believe that. And it can happen at any level of your educational life cycle, uh, educational career. Um, everyone loves leaderboards and it doesn't have to be around grades. You can set up your own type of contest and, and leaderboard with points and, and have people, have your students compete at different levels and have fun with it. And, and uh, you have badging systems out there and you can have different types of prizes. There's all types of things you can do. And, uh, and, and have fun with it, absolutely. Making it fun. Oh, I do have an instructor uh, who dresses up depending on his topic and his is usually uh, English and I'm sorry, um, he's a history professor and he talks about Middle England, Middle English time and will dress up occasionally on that besides having guest speakers come in. So. Uh, it does, and he's a very dynamic speaker, speaker, and that really helps you. If you had trouble speaking before, um, it is really amplified when suddenly you're on camera and you're the only one there and you realize I'm the only one there. So um, you really have to work on it. And it does take a little bit of practice, but you really should work on um, your enunciation, your speaking ability, how you phrase things, um, all sorts of things like that, just to help you as an instructor. Because if you're dull, the class is going to be dull. So you need to spice it up a little bit. And, and you know, like I said, anything you can do to vary it up and make it a little bit more lighthearted. I mean, yeah. you could be talking about the plague. Let's say, you know, uh, come up with some sort of picture or anything like that, that people made fun of it during during that time period. Um, so yeah, anything that you can do to, to help it. And, yeah, I agree with you, Randy. Like in high school, I, you know, I went to high school 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago now, ooh. and I had a chemistry professor and chemistry isn't the most exciting thing, but and he was a very dry monotone professor. But one of the things that he would always do is if you did something good or if you answered something right, he would stick his arm out and give you a thumbs up and he would say, gold star to you. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where it was, 
you know, everyone would just smile and we just like, we'd want that gold star from them. It was completely meaningless. There was no sticker or anything. It would just say gold star to you. But it was just, it was just silly enough to where it meant something to us. And so anything right. you can do just to liven it up and make it kind of fun, it, it keeps you involved. It keeps, it keeps you, it keeps you engaged. Absolutely. So. This tip translates both in the virtual classroom and in the physical classroom. Mm -hmm. So that yep. takes us through our five tips for virtual learner engagement. Um, before we conclude and go into Q&A, we would be remiss not to mention that at the heart of all of this, engaged learning starts with empowered teachers. So we have some, some data here on why it's so important for institutions uh, to empower educators to better engage with their students. Spencer, can you walk us through what we're seeing? Yeah, so I mean, here we have some data that, that we've collected and it basically talks about teachers basically saying, you know, my, my institution has provided sufficient training and professional development for teaching online. And before the pandemic, 38% uh, said they agree. And in preparation for fall 2020, uh, we have 56% say they agree. That's a 16% bump. And what this says to me is that there's still a lot of work to do. It, it basically like, you know, like we, if we compare this to the numbers that we said before, you know, a lot of teachers still say the number one thing they need to focus on is improving engagement. And here we see numbers that say, you know, we have a 16%, a, a, a modest increase of, of feeling prepared. And so we still need to, we still have a lot of work to do to empower and, and prepare instructors to be prepared for, for fall 2020. And so we have, we have work to do to empower teachers and educators uh, in, in this regard. The good news is, is that the tools are out there and there are, there are tips, there are tricks, there are techniques out there to, to get this done. And, and uh, I think that this is, there's work to be done, but I think, I think we have the means and the, and the technology to get it done. Definitely, definitely. So at my institution, um, my role is to provide training and support to faculty for their classes. Um, and I'm practically one of the few people that does all of the training, uh, but I en enlist a lot of our other team members to do that. But along with that, we hold workshops. We just had a series of workshops just before classes started last the past two weeks. We had workshops um, every, just about every day. Uh, and so our staff, such as it is, because we have a very small staff. We do the best we can. And having virtual workshops and sessions has been a godsend for many of the faculty. But we do it on all the technology that people need to use, all the topics uh, and techniques. Um, we have a website that we started populating with tutorials, PDFs, anything that they can take away uh, with to get them started. We're, our goal is to try to get them comfortable with the technology. So we also have, uh, along with that, we have a help desk where they can call. There is an email for the help desk. We also have a email for our area and that comes directly to us. If it goes to the help desk, it then gets spread out to a lot of our other team members who can respond quickly. Um, and what we started doing last semester, if I remember correctly, yeah. We started having a weekly one hour technology forums for anyone who's teaching. We have over 1100 faculty and it's hard to reach all of them. So we offer at least once a week at various times. I've got one coming up uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Um, and it is myself and our Blackboard person since we're on blackboard and we run it for about an hour it usually runs longer uh, and we just answer questions that people either submit or call in or just ask ask away because i'd say nine times out of ten 
the question that a faculty member asks is probably a question that someone else needs an answer to. So we try to answer that and try to, we'll step them through the whole process. And if we can't answer it, we'll get back to them, which is the, really my, my big thing is don't leave people hanging, especially if you're providing support. It's so crucial. Um, faculty sometimes uh, will send you email and say, I'm having problems or call you up, leave your voicemail and you try to get back to them, but for one reason or another, uh, you can't, or the answer you give to them is not exactly what they were looking for. And sometimes faculty just give up and just say, I'm just gonna go ahead and move on, forget this technology, I'm just gonna go ahead and move on, which is a perfectly valid response because they don't have that much time to deal with all of this and they shouldn't. Um, so, we try to do follow up and if we have, because we have a help desk system in place also, if that help desk ticket stays open for a while, we go back and even though an answer was submitted to them, we follow up and say, you know, did you get your question answered? You know, do you have any other questions? Just to make sure that things are going well, because we wanna make, we wanna be proactive and not just be the last minute, what do I do now? So Excellent. getting those questions are great, but that doesn't help you in the long run. So that's what we try to do like that. That's fantastic. Thank you for that, Randy. And um, we are nearing time, but we did have um, one question come through. We had a number of questions come through. We'll have time for probably one of these questions. Um, Spencer, could you speak to how class for Zoom as a product um, helps educators to embody these tips for engagement? Sure, no, I'd, I'd love to, to, yeah. So what we do at Class for Zoom uh, is we take Zoom, which is a fantastic platform for, for web meetings and for, for, for your classes, but we embed these teaching and learning tools and these engagement tools directly into the Zoom meeting experience. And so right within, uh, right within the Zoom meeting experience, much like, a, like a, a conductor of an orchestra just has all the things they need to conduct the orchestra right at their fingertips, the teacher right at their fingertips have all the things that they need to conduct their class. So they have seating charts and they can organize that seating chart based upon who's raised their hand first or based upon who's giving them feedback or based upon real-time participation. If they wanna launch a poll or an assignment, they can launch that for the whole class. Uh, right there from within the environment. And they, if they want to schedule a breakout room, they can do that all within this really integrated Zoom experience. It's really like the best of both worlds. And that's what we've done at Class for Zoom is we've really kind of taken the best educational type experience tools and just married it in with the Zoom, experience, the Zoom platform. And I can speak from someone who's got, we have a, a beta, we're on the, the beta list for running class for Zoom and we're testing it out. It's it's getting it's getting better. <laughs> I won't mince words because we're we're pretty harsh on our side. Um, but it is really close. We're trying to, you know, take it through its uh, all the steps and make sure things work the way we want them to. And it's looking pretty good. I'm 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 impressed. I'm very am very impressed with it. Um, so I'm looking forward to each new build of the beta copies. So, uh, I can't wait till it's finally released. When is that? When is that going to be released? Yeah. yeah we, I mean, we, what, what Randy's referring to is we've just gone through, um, our very successful beta program and we're transitioning now into our general availability, which is happening on February 2nd. And so now we're gearing up on, you know, our, our general availability of our Mac client. And so we're very excited to have this first inaugural release of class for Zoom. And so we're all very excited. Uh, many lessons learned from, from the beta program. And, and uh, that's uh, what Randy is referring to because his institution was participating in that program with us. Um, great tie-in, probably a great place to, to wrap this up. Um, as Spencer alluded to, we are getting ready to release our product for general availability. 
Um, we would be happy to speak with anyone more. If you're interested, please go to classforzoom.com where you can find more information about how to contact our team. Um, thank you, Randy. Thank you, Spencer, for participating in this panel. And thank you to everybody for joining today.